Hello, Duke fans. Welcome to episode number 5454 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. I am Jason Evans, and I am joined, as always, by Sam Klein and Donald Wine. Sam, you in Denver? I am in Denver, uh, and I believe as of tonight, I am a level 10 uh, Pokemon trainer. And Donald, you're in Washington, correct? I am in Washington, D.C., and I'm a level 3 Pokemon trainer. Um, I don't know what that means, but I know I have three levels. Um, So I'm a level 0 Pokemon trainer. Um, Sam, I was saying to Donald earlier that um, I think my Facebook feed and the conversations I have with people, there are only three things happening in the world right now. Police and people are being shot, Pokemon Go, and Hamilton. Those are like the only three topics anyone has talked to me about in like weeks. Do you want to talk about Duke basketball? Oh, that's a good idea because like they didn't even, hey, hey, they didn't even, they didn't even prompt me with that. I just figured we would, we would, we would jump right into that. So that nice. was organic right there. Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> if only Lin-Manuel Miranda was coming to a Duke game, we would, you know, we'd be full circle here or something. Well, like he that. has some time now. So, hey, Lin, Lin-Manuel, we, we got you, we got you, man. We got your ticket. Come on out. Um, I don't know yeah, he, do, but sure. <laughs> If he performed at halftime, I'm sure that we could arrange to get him decent seats. Uh, Okay, so anyway, um, there is some Duke basketball news. We have the schedule, or at least the non-conference portion of the schedule, has been announced, has been released. Um, uh, It just came out earlier today. I'm not sure we may post this tomorrow or something like that. You may go, hey, what the heck, guys? The schedule was released a day or two ago. Give us some time for production, people. we got to take a couple minutes to get these things produced and put together. But the basketball schedule came out, and um, I'll say it in a word. The non-conference schedule is disappointing. Um, There are two major, major significant opponents. Um, We play Kansas in New York in Madison Square Garden, and we play Michigan State in the ACC Big Ten Challenge, and we get them at home in Cameron. Man, that's going to be a great ticket. And aside from that, schedule's just weak. It's not – the non-conference schedule is is bad. There's no other way to say it than it's bad. We get Florida in the Jimmy V Classic. Florida is – you know, the, the recruiting has really suffered the past couple of years with Billy Donovan leaving and Florida just they aren't what they were, you know, five, six years ago or so. We get UNLV. UNLV's team was decimated by um, by defections to the NBA and elsewhere. And UNLV won't be all that good this year. Um, uh, the best other team, non-conference team on the schedule is probably uh, the winner of the Cincinnati Rhode Island game. Rhode Island's pretty good. Rhode Island. People may not realize this. Danny Hurley is the coach of Rhode Island, and Danny Hurley has put together a heck of a Rhode Island team, um, and they will probably be ranked in the top 20, top 25 a lot of this season. So that's a <clears throat> that's another legitimate opponent. But aside from that, it's it's pretty darn weak. I mean, Penn State, William and Mary, App State, Maine, Grand Canyon. Oh, and by the way, we have a mystery game. On Saturday, November 12th, we were supposed to play Albany, and then we were supposed to play Marist, but they're both from New York, and the state of New York is boycotting North Carolina because of the the bathroom law thing, um, and I'm not going to get into the politics of how stupid that is, the law, not, anyway, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but we don't even know who we're playing on the 12th, because no one from North Carolina will travel, no one from New York will travel to North Carolina. Um, Donald, let me start with you. Uh, are you as disappointed in the schedule as I am? Uh, I'm disappointed uh, in a way. So it, there's there's a couple of things here. One, yes, if you're looking at the schedule, you, you see it's probably the weakest schedule that we've had in quite a long time, is, uh, you know, particularly non-conference. Um, you know, like you said, the games that you pointed out, Kansas, uh, Michigan State are our two major games. Um, and that's really it. You know, we have Florida, we have UNLV. Those are two name brands. We could have uh, Cincinnati. Um, but really, like if you think about previous years, you know, we have a big we have a big game in that Champions Classic. We have a big game in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. And usually we have a holiday tournament that has a couple one or at least one or two really big games. This year, the tournament that we're in uh, at Mohegan Sun Arena um, doesn't really fit that void, you know, fit that uh, uh that example that we've had in the last couple of years. So I think that's kind of Rhode, what Island. Seen. Rhode Island. Rhode Island's the best other team in that tournament. And that's mm-hmm. just, that's not the caliber we should be playing. As right. I mean, if year. you think, you know, if you think back to when we went to the Bahamas and we're like, Oh, we're going to the Bahamas. That's kind of weird. But we played three top five teams in three days and, and beat them all um, a few years ago. So, I, I mean, you, you go from that to this sort of thing. 
uh, this sort of uh, a holiday tournament, it, it kind of rings hollow, um, and it kind of seems like it's a letdown compared to previous years, if, if you want to say that. But uh, also, I'm looking at the schedule. Usually, we have a game that is uh, right before New Year's. We have a couple uh, non-conference games right before New Year's, and then we kick into the uh, New Year, and we get into ACC season. It looks like the last non-conference game we have is before Christmas, and then we have – uh, I don't, we haven't seen the conference schedule yet, but it looks like we're going to have maybe, you know, 10 days off um, and then the new year will begin. So um, that'll be a, an interesting change as well. Um, one thing that I'm wondering, and, and obviously we people out there, we don't have any insight into uh, the, the scheduling and how it goes about. But part of me thinks that um, that this is not the plan. This was not the plan to have some of these teams um, like Grand Canyon and, and Maine um, and Tennessee State. I think the issue might have been, um, and and this is just me hypothesizing here, um, that some of these teams um, were replacements for teams that Duke maybe wanted to play or maybe asked to play. And some of these teams, these bigger teams out there, wanted no part of us um, because of uh, the team that we are predicted to have. Um, That happens a lot. Um, You know, there's a lot of teams that will not come to Cameron. Um, they want us to travel to their particular game because it's a it's a it's a game that is a a big revenue game for them. Um, that, that's why we end up playing a lot of neutral site games um, because we won't travel to basically fill these fill these pockets of people and they won't travel to Cameron. So we agree to meet in the middle somewhere. Um, and I'm thinking this year that maybe some of these bigger, I don't want to say they're really you know, top ten, top twenty teams, but maybe some of these you know fifteen to twenty five teams that we would normally play in December. Um, in that home game at Madison Square Garden, maybe they either fell off like Florida was probably supposed to be decent, um, but maybe a lot of them just didn't answer that call and say, you know, what, we don't want it. We don't need that on our schedule. That's not going to help our program. Um, and we were kind of left out in the woods. But um, Sam, what do you think of the schedule? Yeah, I, 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 I squint and see a simil- more similar schedule to what we normally have than what you guys are seeing. I think the main difference that, that you both pointed out was that the exempt tournament this year doesn't have as good of a field. And I don't know how the how that contract negotiation works. Like if, if Duke agrees to go to that tournament because some other set of teams is gonna be there, like Maui always gets a really good field. And, and the ones at Madison Square Garden get a good field. And as you pointed out, the one in the Bahamas we had a few years ago where we beat Louisville in the championship, that had a really good field. This one might have just been, hey, we're going to pay you, you know, whatever the, whatever the payout is for showing up to the tournament. And it's, a, it's, one, it's another one of these exempt tournaments, and you get your extra home games, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to come? And, and Duke probably has some price on that. And, and if that tournament met it, then sure, we're, we'll, we'll come to that. Um, as you point out, Florida is down from what they – from where they normally would be. UNLV is going to be not as good as they were in, in recent past. And and honestly, if you look at the last few years of scheduling, it's not like Duke is going and playing away games at, at other good teams or even at any teams in the, in the non-conference. We're saving the away games for those exempt tournaments, which are really neutral site games. And then mostly it's, it's the games in, in New York. Other than that, Duke doesn't really play traditional road games outside of like the ACC Big Ten Challenge. And this year it happens to be in Cameron. So I'm not fretting, I think, as much as you guys are and as much as I've seen some of the reaction from the media today when the schedule came out. Um, but at the same time, you know, our, our strength of schedule is not going to be what it has been in years past. I, I haven't looked at the ACC, you know, home and away schedule yet and seen how, how that breaks down. Um, I, can, I but, can give you that. But, uh, but I, what, what I was going to say was that, you know, regardless of that, uh, Duke's going to have a really strong team. There will be a lot of strong teams in the ACC that we will play all of at least once. And I, I, I don't know. I just I don't get as, as worked up about it. I think there are a couple good games that we can showcase. And as as the three of us were discussing earlier, um, you know, hopefully hopefully a couple of us get to go to that game in Las Vegas because that would be a lot of fun. And that's yeah, you know, for, we don't tr- for, we don't traditionally play um, yeah it, like you said road games, road games and. and uh, and that is a road the Las game. Vegas game will be a true road game. I mean, I, I don't think it'll be on their campus. It'll probably be at one of the um, bigger not, arenas. It, it, it's, it's at an arena on the strip, so it's, it's not at, right, the, exactly. it's at the team, the new T-Mobile, uh, the T-Mobile arena, uh, which right. is brand new. It just opened. It's going to be where the NHL uh, franchise plays. But I think, um, and I, I may be wrong on this. Somebody out there, correct me if, when you're listening to this. I think UNLV has decided to move their home games to that arena. 
Um, no, most of their home games are still on campus. It, they're least, still at Thomas and Mac. Thomas and yeah. Mac, yeah, they're still at the Thomas yeah. and Mac, but they may play I, some high-profile games there. Yes. So it'll yeah. be it'll be a little bit like when you play St. John's in the Garden. Correct. They put out a similar they put out a similar release uh, in the last couple of weeks about their non-conference schedule, and it highlighted the Duke game as not being in the home arena. So okay. this, I think this is one of the if this is the or it might be the only game or it's one of it's one of only a couple of games that they're playing in this bigger arena that's not on campus, but that isn't far away. I mean, the UNLV. Um, it's like two miles. It's no less than two not miles. Far from the strip, yeah. Uh, but but speaking as a speaking as a Duke fan who lives west of the Mississippi River, uh, thank you, Duke basketball, for scheduling a game on our in our half of the country. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe I'll get to go at a reasonable price. So. I'm uh, I'm waiting for the game time to come out to see if I can get some cheap flights out to Vegas. Hey, uh, look, Jason, before you say anything, I, I want to just point out you were talk. Uh, Sam was talking about the conference schedule. I got it in front of me. Here we don't have the dates, obviously, but here is what we have: the home and road, uh, home, and then just away. So the home and home games we have: North Carolina, Wake Forest, Florida State, and Miami this year. Home we have Georgia Tech, Clemson, NC State, Pitt, and Boston College, and then. On the road, we have Virginia, Virginia Tech, Louisville, Syracuse, and Notre Dame. And that's tough. Virginia and Louisville clearly are going to be two of the top. And Notre Dame. We are terrible at the at Notre Dame. We, have been we are terrible at Notre Dame. But, I mean, Virginia, uh, arguably, Virginia and Louisville are the top two teams in the ACC. I think that they are, um, aside from Duke. Um, and to play both of those on the road is a real, real burden. Um, not easy. Uh, although, at least we don't have to play them twice. The teams that we play twice, I think, um, you know, we did all right. We're, we're always going to suffer in the play twice category because we have UNC as our opponent every single year. And FSU is actually pretty good this year as well. But um, uh, the other thing I, w- I want to add a couple of the little things about the schedule. I think the, uh, the place where the schedule is faulting um, is that Florida and UNLV are not what they have been in past years. If uh, if Florida was a top 15, top 20 team, if UNLV had a lot of you know potential NBA talent as they have had in recent years, and they were a team that looked like they're going to be around the top 25 or so, this schedule I think would look very, very different. Um, uh, but 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 they aren't. Both those programs appear to be down from where they've been lately. And uh, look, I, you know I don't know how far in advance some of these contracts come out, um, but. Uh, I, it's possible that Duke sort of entered negotiations and, and set up these games before they knew exactly what these teams would be like. I mean, look, there were kids, there were, there were high profile recruits still, still coming to school, you know, a month or two ago. So you don't know that whether Florida or UNLV was going to bring in one more high profile player. There's certainly both, both the schools are players on the major recruiting scene. The other thing I wanted to add really quickly is the reason I think I'm disappointed um, is that unlike the past couple of years, Duke is really, really experienced. The past few seasons, Duke has been relying on newcomers, um, even more so than they will this year. Now, that's not to say we have an incredible freshman class. We've got a freshman class that a lot of people think may be, you know, one of the greats, if not the greatest freshman classes that Duke has ever had, which is really saying something. But we are loaded with experience. And I think in past years, Coach K has maybe been a little reluctant to overschedule early in the season because he knew he needed to bring along his freshmen, his new players, um, uh, you know, a little bit slower and get them ready. Uh, Sorry, but Grayson Allen and uh, Matt Jones and Emil Jefferson, those guys don't need any time to get ready. Those guys know the ACC. They know what it takes to play Duke basketball. They know what it takes to play on on a big stage as well as anyone possibly can. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's why I think it's sort of a pity that we aren't testing ourselves a little bit more. Although, I mean, in fairness, in Kansas and Michigan State, you've got two of the other teams that are considered among the favorites to win the national title. I mean, how much tougher do you get than those two teams? So yeah, yeah. You're, you're, maybe it's you're fine. You're concerned that there aren't enough opportunities for us to stomp on good teams um, and that we're going to be wasting our time as you... Yes, you, so, yeah, you know see, I remember... Saying. I, I'm not sure how old you guys were. I remember 1999. Now, I'm not saying we're going to stomp teams the way we did in 99, but I feel kind of like we're going to stomp teams the way we did in 1999. And, <laughs> and What a shame uh, if it's only going to be against Grand Canyon in Maine. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm not sure if you – in 99, there was – we played a game against – I want to say it was against UCLA, um, maybe Oklahoma, maybe both of them, where the game – we were up by 30 at halftime. Like, it was, it was one of those games where – you said, 
okay, it was UCLA, I remember it now. And, and UCLA just went, all right, well, we're just not even in the same class. We're not in the same league with this team. Um, and, and those games are kind of fun when it's a good opponent. UCLA was like a top 10, top 15 opponent, and we, we curb stomped them. Um, those are really fun. And yeah, there aren't enough opportunities for that this year. <laughs> Don't worry, once ACC season comes around, there'll be plenty of good opponents. So moving on to our next topic, we have a really special guest joining us on the show this week. I'm not going to spoil it by telling you all who it is, but oh well, he's the voice of the Duke Blue Devils. Here's the interview we had with the great, the wonderful, the retiring Bob Harris. Well, none of us are old enough to remember it, but in the fall of 1976, exactly 40 years ago, Blue Devil fans tuning in to listen to games heard a new voice. It was a man who had been working in the sales office of a local radio station, WDNC, and his name, of course, was Bob Harris, and he was the brand new voice of the Blue Devils. Forty years later, Bob Harris just announced that he's about to embark on his final season at Duke, a remarkable career that includes, and wait for it, folks, you're not going to believe these numbers. It includes 459 consecutive Duke football games, including six bowl games and an ACC championship game. It includes 1,358 basketball games, 13 Final Fours, five national titles. He's a member of the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. He has so many other awards and accolades, we don't have time to list them all. We are honored, thrilled here on the DBR podcast to be joined by none other than Bob Harris, the voice of the Blue Devils, and one of the coolest guys around. Bob, thanks so much for taking time to be with us today. Well, it's my pleasure, and thanks for having me. By the way, before we get into our questions, I want to mention something. So uh, Donald was the one who reached out to you, and when he reached out to you, um, he shared your email address. Now, I'm not going to share your full email address because I don't want everyone out there emailing you, but just the beginning of it, the fact that your email address starts with with the email Duke Voice at... Um, I love that your email is Duke Voice. You really embrace being the voice of the Blue Devils, don't you? <laughs> I really have. And, you know, it's uh, – I don't know how it began. Uh, I don't know who called me that for the first time, but uh, it, it certainly wasn't me. But, uh, you know, there were other voices that, uh, you know, around. And uh, so that's – I guess that's where it uh, where it began. But, uh, yeah, you know, there's some, t- some people who just now, you know, refer to me as, hey, voice, how you doing? And, you know, go right on. <laughs> but that's <laughs> – Maybe they've forgotten my real name. I don't know. <laughs> I will never be cool enough to be called voice. That is really <laughs> that is great. <laughs> I'll let Donald take over. He's going to ask you a little bit mostly about football. Great. All Thanks, right. Jason. Um, and thank you, Bob, again, for, for coming on the uh, the podcast. This is a, a tremendous honor to have you on here, especially uh, with your career. Um, we're going to start off with a simple question. Well, it may not be so simple. Um, you know, people know that you are involved in the program but how well do you, do you get to know the players that come through uh, the program for football or basketball? Well, that's one of the, the, the real uh, pluses for my job is to get to know these young men uh, as, as well as I do. Um, you know, when I first started, I was uh, selling advertising for uh, WDNC radio. And so, you know, I was on the street most of the day. I didn't have time to go to practice that much. I would go to the – they used to have Monday night practices in those days because Monday, of course, was, you know, lab day, and that was the only time they could practice. So I would go to the Monday night practices just to, you know, to see what was going on. But then later, you know, when I started traveling with the team, I got to know a lot of them personally. And I think for me that's been one of the biggest uh, pluses for this job is getting to know young men uh, like – those that have come through the Duke programs and uh, just to be able to, you know, to say, Hey, I, I knew him, you know, when he was a, uh, you know, freshman, sophomore, whatever, you know, at Duke, you know, it's not, it's not like I'm bragging that I know these people, but in a way, yes, I am because, you know, so many people all, all they get to know these players uh, uh, as uh, a, a Jersey number or a picture in the paper or something like that. But, you know, I get to know them as human beings, as students, as brothers and sisters and, and sons of great parents. I get to know their parents uh, a good bit of the time. And uh, that's, uh, you know, for me, that's that's just about as important as, as uh, talking about them on game day 
But, um, you know, when you get to, to be around those kids, and I I told Coach uh, Dr. Kevin White uh, last fall we were at practice one morning, and uh, he had mentioned something about one of the, the uh, football players getting uh, an accolade from uh, something here in, in Durham. And uh, I said, you know, Kevin, I am so blessed because I have a job that not a lot of uh, other broadcasters have. And I'm not trying to put anybody down or any programs down, but it's the truth. I said, I don't have to get up every morning and check the uh, newspaper, the police blotter, and see who got arrested the night before. And when I put a microphone in front of these guys' faces, um, I don't have to worry about what they're going to say, no, more importantly, how they're going to say it. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you're exactly right. You are blessed. And uh, and that's the truth. I have, in my 41 years, actually, of covering Duke, um, there's been only one interview that I did that I didn't put on the air. And I may have overstepped my bounds, but it was a young man a long, long time ago. And uh, maybe about the second or third year I was at Duke. But he had a, uh, a terrific stuttering problem. And I just, I, I don't know, I just... My inner self wouldn't let me put it on because I, I guess I didn't want to embarrass him. But you know, it might not have. Maybe I—that's what I said. Maybe I overstepped my uh, my bounds on that. But you know, the rest of the time, yeah, they've—I've uh, never held one back. That's tremendous, and and that's a ton of interviews over over such a, a fantastic career. Uh, on the football side, you've had you know not just players; you had several coaches that have come through uh, the program, and in a sport that's has a lot of turnover how difficult is it to develop relationships with those coaches and which coaches do you have a particularly good relationship with well you know it when a coach is at, at a place for four five years maybe even just three years it, it is tough to really get to know them well but i i make it a point to do that because i deal with them almost on a daily basis um you know we do a, a daily radio show which i usually tape uh you know, I, I, like now, I go to practice on uh, Sunday night. I tape uh, Monday and Tuesday shows with, with Co uh, Coach Cut, and then Tuesday is media day, so I do Thursday, Friday, and Saturday uh, for those. But, you know, I'm doing a pregame show with him, and, uh, you know, just I, I'm around them so much that uh, I, I get to know them a lot better than than I did at the very beginning when I was uh, when I was not – going to being able to go to practice as much as I do now. So <clears throat> I think that's been a, the, the big plus for me is, is being able to spend time with them. And, you know, I'll usually talk to them uh, either before or after practice, or sometimes they'll even come over during practice uh, and, and just chit-chat for a little bit. Want to know, you know, how my family's doing or, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, things like that. It's not always football. And that's what makes it so good. And, you know, I started out with Mike McGee in, in 1975 uh, when I came uh, to WDNC as a, uh, an ad salesman. And, uh, you know, it just uh, – I, I knew most of the uh, assistant coaches at that time still keep up with some of them. And that's the amazing thing. You know, 40 years later, you're still, you know, talking to some people that – I mean, I, you know, I keep up with, with Mike's brother, Jerry, quite a bit. I saw him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, here in Durham, and uh, you know, it's still that same feeling as I had uh, when I first met him uh, back in 1975. So that's that's the big thing is getting to uh, to be friends with with men, and not just you know a, a broadcaster coach relationship. And you know, we've had some really good ones. We've had some guys that uh, you know they they struggled, but that's you know that's the way it goes when you have a program that this is kind of down. But I, I really think that uh, that we have seen a a, um, a resurgence of Duke football, and uh, by the, the uh, evidence of the the last four years with David Cutcliffe and winning the Pinstripe Bowl last year, and you know I think um, I think this year is going to be another good year. We probably face the strongest uh, schedule we have we have had in years and years, at least in my memory, and uh, it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be a test, but I think with the kids that we've got, and I say kids, you know, they're young men, but still, to me, you know, when you're 73 years old and they're uh, 18 to 22, yeah, they're still kids to me. But uh, you know, that's the that's the thing that I really like most is being able to deal with these kids on a, on a daily basis in, in some respects. And I've gotten uh, emails and I've seen tweets uh, on Twitter, you know, uh, about my retirement and all of them wishing me good luck and, you know, all this stuff. And it's just, you know, 
to be remembered like that is, is just uh, it's a great feeling. And basketball, same way. I usually get to know basketball players better because we're together a whole lot more with traveling. You know, we, give, we do probably 15 uh, flights a year, things like that. And so you get to, you know, spend some time with them on the airplane or, you know, when you get to the hotel, you got downtime and uh, things like that. So that's uh, that's been a, a, a maybe even a larger plus for me with, with them than uh, than with football. So you mentioned the pinstripe bowl and, uh, you know, over the last few years, you know, football has kind of crept into well into basketball season with us competing into December. Does that add to the stress um, of you having to go back and forth between basketball and football? And, and how do you how do you handle that? Well, you know, I've I've been fortunate that uh, the, the IMG folks have uh, uh, been able to get a um, uh, get a fill in for me uh, when I do have because uh, I've had this uh, relationship with uh, both football and basketball for uh, a long time. Uh, when we first had our uh, our first head to head, that was at the uh, uh, the game with with uh, the football game with NC State uh, in Durham, and the basketball game was with Kentucky, and it was in uh, Springfield at the first uh, Peach Basket Classic, and uh, I couldn't go. Uh, well, I I had a I had a thing, and I took it to. Uh, uh, Coach uh, Shushevsky for the second time. This was the second game, and uh, I said, Coach, I got a problem. He said, What is it? And I said, Well, they haven't uh, got this cloning thing down, uh, you know, as like as much as I'd like it, and uh, I can't be in two places at one time. And he looked at the schedule and he says, You don't have a problem. I said, What do you mean? He said, You stay with football. He said, They only get you eleven Saturdays a year. We get you thirty plus games a year. We can do without you for one game. And I thought, you know, he said, it, and on top of that. Uh, think about it. If you leave football, the fans are going to think you have given up on them, and we can't have that. Now, how many coaches would say that in in today's world? <laughs> you know, that's just you, most of them are out for just their program and to heck with the others. And uh, but uh, that's not been the way it is. They have worked together with me so much, and uh, like I said, we have a uh, a fill in who uh, who will take the games that when we do have. Something like uh, last year we had a uh, a Friday game uh, in New York, I believe, and then a Sunday afternoon game there as well, and a football game Saturday afternoon. I knew there was no way that I could, uh, you know, fly from one to the other to the other and come back. But uh, so they sent uh, my replacement up to do the football, uh, do the basketball, and I did the football. And I think uh, they, uh, I think the fans probably have appreciated that because of my my loyalty to the football program. And this is the last football question before I'll kick it to Sam for basketball. Uh, give us a quick uh, one of your favorite or crazy stories you have about Coach Cutcliffe. <laughs> there, you know, there are not a lot of crazy stuff with him. He's uh, he's really a, a, a great guy to work with. Uh, you know, I've just really enjoyed him. I've, I've been with him on the road uh, doing some speeches and things like that. And the one thing that I always uh, say in my introduction is, you know, and when people ask me, you know, what kind of guy is he, you know, away from, from the football coaching aspect, I said, well, we all know he's a great coach, but he's an even better man. And I think that's about the highest uh, compliment I can give David Cutcliffe. But he's got a uh, – in some, time, some ways he's got a very dry sense of humor, but he can he can stick it to you when, when it need be. And uh, we uh, we have a great relationship and, and things like that. And uh, – uh, we the good thing is we respect each other's time, and that's that's been the best thing I think is to be able to to work with a man uh, with the caliber of of David and uh, to be able to have such a great relationship with him. But uh, as far as I don't know something wild or crazy, uh, uh, you know I, <laughs> I I really don't think I've had anything that that would fit into that category. And that's that's fine. But, but, uh, we we always like to ask. Uh, our, uh, our guests, if they have any stories about our coaches, kind of gives an insight. But uh, the fact that he, you know, doesn't have anything means it could also mean a good thing too. But uh, yeah. thank you very much, Bob. And I'm going to kick it You're to him now. He's going to give you some basketball questions. Okay. Um, thanks, Donald. I'm actually going to start by telling Bob um, that we uh, we've met a couple times. I was a uh, I was an equipment manager for the football team for a couple of years under Coach Cutcliffe, and uh, okay. there were a couple practices. <laughs> there, there were a couple practices. Um, during which you know that some of the managers are not all, we're not always working during practice. Sometimes we just get to stand and watch. Um, so a couple a couple times during don't practice, tell that out loud. <laughs> yeah, well, Wes knows. Don't worry. Um, but yeah. 
there were a couple times during practice where I'd, where I'd see you, you know, walking around on the sideline and I'd go stand over next to you just so we could, we could talk about what was going on. And I, mm-hmm. I, uh, yep. I don't think I ever actually got a chance to introduce myself. Um, but so for all those conversations we had, thank you very much. Um, well, you're welcome was, very was, much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but that being said, Donald asked you a little bit about football. I'm going to move to, uh, to basketball. Um, and so my first question is, um, over all the, oh, there are all the basketball games you've done, and there, there have been uh, over 1,100 of them. Um, what are some of the games that stood out the most to you? And you can pick the 1992 Elite Eight, and you can pick the game at UNC in 2012, um, but feel free to highlight others if you, if you so choose. Well, you know, those two uh, games that you talked about, the Leitner shot, of course, uh, in Philadelphia to send us to the uh, Final Four in the second straight national championship, that was – that was something that uh, it was it was really wild to, to as I look think about uh, what did happen that night. But it, it's something that you know you you can't plan for. You can, somebody asked me one time, so how did you rehearse or what did you do to rehearse that? I said you can't rehearse play by play calls. You just have to watch and see what's going on and and describe it uh, as best you can and. Uh, that was one for the ages. As a matter of fact, uh, I used to do uh, talk shows uh, probably once a month for a uh, station up in Minneapolis when we were playing in the regionals and the final four up there in that stretch. And they would always play that uh, audio cut uh, when, they, when they introduced me. And one day I said, have you guys not worn that thing out yet? And <laughs> the, the guy said, uh, this is the third taping and we're thinking about going for a fourth. But uh, he said, we've worn the other three out. So, uh, and he said, but you know, we've done some research and we have found out that uh, this is the second most recognizable cut in co- in basketball history, not just college. He said, you know what the first one is? I said, well, it's got to be Johnny Most and Havlicek stole the ball. He said, you're right. And I'm thinking, you know, for me to even being mentioned in the same breath with that iconic call uh, is, is just, uh, it's mind boggling. But, um, you know, that that gave me more recognition nationally than I could have ever, ever bought and paid for. I guarantee you that. And uh, people will still, every now and then, so I come by and say, do the Leitner call for me one time. You know, things like that. And, not you know, not that I bragging or anything like that, but uh, I'll, I'll give it to them and, and you know, satisfy their, their whims. But uh, hang on, hang on, that, hang on. Before you continue, yeah. before you continue, can, yeah. can you do yeah, it here? Yeah, make him do it. it. He's got to do it. Do it. <laughs> I've, I, I've, wa- I've watched it. I've watched it about forty or fifty times, so I think I know it at mm-hmm. this point. But I think you. I think you you'll do it better. Do. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. All right. They throw it the length of the floor to Leitner. Catches, comes down, dribbles, shoots, scores. Christian Leitner has hit the bucket at the buzzer. Blue Devils win it 104-103. Look out, Minneapolis. Here come the Blue Devils. I got I like, goosebumps. I, I think I especially this like This just the became way, the best podcast of all time. The way that, <laughs> that I, I, I love the, the sound of bucket at the buzzer. That's my, that's my like, favorite. That's my favorite. The way, the way that that sounds yeah. coming out of your mouth is so cool. Um, so anyway, thanks. Sorry. Continue. Any, any other games that you wanted to highlight? (laughs) Well, you know, anytime we've beaten North Carolina has been great. Uh, and you know, the, uh, the, the shot over there a couple of years ago, um, that was awesome. I think, you know, the one game that really sticks out in the Duke Carolina series was the, uh, the infamous, uh, seven, nothing, uh, first half game. Uh, when we played them here, and and Coach Smith decided he was going to make uh, Duke come out of the zone. Uh, Bill Foster was still coaching then, so we played a lot of zone in, in those days before Coach uh, K came, and then now he's playing a lot of zone. But uh, we had uh, Coach had decided he was going to play that zone, and uh, and and you know they could or Coach. Uh, let me start over there. Coach Smith uh, had decided he was going to play that zone and make Duke, uh, you know adjust to it well uh we made uh we made a couple of baskets and a, and a free throw and they took two shots in the first half and one was uh rich yonaker and he shot one from the left corner in front of the students um as i looked down from the crow's nest and he didn't touch anything but the floor and that was the first time i ever heard the expression air ball 
and he heard it enough that afternoon and later on too as as it went but then uh in the second half they came out and played uh, straight up and they scored 40 and we scored 40 and the final score was 47 to 40 and I heard one player in the locker. I was in the, the Carolina locker room to tape a thing because the, the ACC tournament was the next week, and I was doing uh, an ACC preview special for uh, the radio station. And I heard uh, two of them talking, and I wasn't trying to listen in, but uh, this guy was really getting all over uh, Coach Smith, and he said, you know, if he'd just let us play like we were capable of, we could have won this game. And I'm thinking, whoa. Somebody actually challenged Coach Smith, but uh, that was uh, that was quite unusual there. But uh, you know, to to be able to to do a game like that, and uh, then you know the others, the, the buzzer beaters, or uh, you know just uh, when you when you take a team down when they've got uh, superstars and uh, you're not supposed to win, those are great uh, great games. Um, you know, my my first uh, national championship game was uh, or a champion uh the the game that was a championship for for Duke in in uh, 91 that was uh, that was so exciting to be able to do because I had done several uh championship games uh including my first one in 1978 when Duke played uh, Kentucky in uh, in Dallas and uh, we lost by a few points and uh it was it was so disheartening for that bunch because that 78 uh, Duke team was a very special group because you had a couple of freshmen named Banks and Denard and uh, sophomore and Jaminski and Spinarkle was a junior and the captain of the team. and But th- there was just – it was a, a unique group, and they still are. Those guys stayed as closely connected as they can given they're spread out all over the country. But I still, you know, I'm on their mailing list, for heaven's sakes, and I get, you know, all these communications between them and what's going on with them and their families and kids, and uh, I think some of them are uh, in in the grand grandfather category already. But anyway, uh, it, it's just uh, to, to have uh, experiences like that, you know, you, you, I don't care how good you are and how much money you've got as a broadcaster, you can't buy things like that. You just have to be in the right place at the right time. And um, moving over and talking about Coach K a little bit, um, he's he's been at, at Duke probably the longest of anybody who you know other than you who, who who's been in in your in your program your your area of the university. Um, how has your relationship with him uh, evolved over the years? Because obviously you've been working with him for for almost the entire time you've been at Duke. Yes, because uh, I worked with Coach Foster for five years, and then Mike came in the. Uh, uh, after the 1980 season, and um, you know he he went through some real tough times uh, that second and third, especially the third year, um, because you know Duke wasn't winning as much as some of those fans thought that we should win, and uh, they were all over him, was writing letters to Tom Butters. And they they formed a group called the Concerned Iron Dukes, and they wanted him out. And thanks to the late Tom Butters, he. Uh, uh, very stubbornly said, he's my coach, and I'm sticking with him. And uh, they wouldn't fire him, but that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> he, uh, he he stuck with his guns, and that was uh, that was a great show of confidence. And, uh, you know, actually he gave him a new contract uh, during that uh, the, the latter part of that season. And uh, I think that's what endeared the two of them uh, together. And uh, But seeing Mike... I think it was that third year we were in the uh, in the locker room after a loss at home, and uh, he and I were the only two people in the locker room. Everybody else had already gone. We had done some radio interviews, and we were just sitting there, and I was wrapping up my equipment, and I looked over, and he was just distraught. And he said, Bob, if they'll just give us the time, I know we can be successful here. Yeah, we could have won more games if we had played some zone, but that would have defeated the whole purpose. I wanted to set and build a program, not just for one year or two years, but a program that will stand the test. And uh, kind of a silence, and I looked back up at him, and I could see his eyes were watering and his chin was quivering. He said, if they'll just give me the time. Well, in 1991, when we won the first championship, he and I were by ourselves in the coach's locker room again afterwards, and 
he kind of leaned back after we finished and uh, leaned back in his chair and put his arm, his his hands behind his head and uh, just closed his eyes. And I said, Mike, I'm so glad they gave you the time. His eyes popped open. He looked at me and he says, you remembered that? I said, Mike, I'll never forget it because I think that was the defining moment in our relationship. He said, it was. It really was. And I, th- I really think we built – a relationship that's not just a coach broadcaster. It's it's a uh, a Bob and Mike. It's a uh, Shushevsky family and Harris family, and uh, you know just things like that. You can't. There's no way you can buy things like that. Too many people think that they can buy happiness and they can buy this and that and the other. A lot of them can, unfortunately, but this is something you can't buy. And I'm so proud that that uh, he and I are are friends and. Um, we sat down for about a half hour a couple of weeks ago and talked about the retirement and things like that and it's still it's the same thing but one of the one of the best things that happened was last year when we were at the final four <clears throat> and uh, I got a call from an ESPN uh, reporter from New York and she wanted to interview me for for the championship game and I said sure so she went you know 5 minutes of the you know usual questions and then she stopped and said you know, Bob, everything I hear about Mike Krzyzewski is is good. She said, I know there's got to be some dirt somewhere. She said, and as long as you've been with him, you would be the one that would, would know that dirt. She said, give me just one nugget, just, just one little nugget of dirt. I gave her a little bit of silence, and I said, well, the closest thing I can come to that is Mike Krzyzewski and I have never had a crossword in 35 years together. And there was dead silence. And finally, she said, "Well, that, that that really wasn't what I was looking for, but that was good." <laughs> so, you know, you just have to have to go with the truth, and it'll it'll keep everything in line, I guess. But uh, I think that really um, defines our friendship. And uh, but to watch him coach and how he has changed his. Uh, different uh, the different things that he does to to get teams uh, to play their best and you know you can't have a set model and try to make the players fit into that mold you got to adapt your uh, program to the talent that they've got and try to bring out the best in them and I think he is probably the best at doing that of anybody I've ever seen. And uh, I just, I'm just so happy that I've had 36 years with Mike and one more to come. That 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 was all. Uh, that was really great. Um, and, and you know, one of the are we really going to ask more questions after that? I, I'm yeah, getting I know, chills right? after this. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that I, uh, was remarkable I insight. I, I I was just going to say that um, you know because be, I'm asking the basketball questions, but but. Um, having been a very small part of the football program, I'm always thinking about football and, yeah. and what you just said about how um, Mike Krzyzewski wanted, even at the beginning to, to not have a, a basketball team, but a basketball program. I mean, how many yes. times do we hear, how many times have we heard coach Cutcliffe say that over the last, whatever, eight or nine years? Um, exactly. That, that it's, about, exactly. it's about building a program. And it, it sounds like the same, same philosophy. Well, you know, it, it's ironic. You, you bring that up because it was in, David's second year, I think late in his second year, we were sitting in his office. We had taped some programs, uh, some interviews one day, one day and uh, he was talking about, you know, the, the program was coming, it's building, and, you know, this, just this, you know, and I said, you know, Mike, uh, uh, David, I, uh, I remember talking to a guy some years back who uh, said basically the same thing you did, and um, it all worked out for him pretty well. And he looked at me real fast. He said, who is that? I said, the guy that occupies the top office over there on the other side of Cameron. And he said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no. Same thing. Same procedure that you are taking. Well, I only hope I can be, you know, <laughs> a, a little bit of uh, the success that he has been. Well, hey, he's done pretty doggone good for himself, I think. So, <laughs> but that was, that was ironic that, you know, I don't know why I thought of it, but, uh, it just it was the right moment and I just blurted it out. Um yeah, so that that's uh it's it's a fascinating connection. Um one more question for you about basketball before I move to Jason. Um uh, other than other than Cameron Indoor, um what's your favorite venue in the ACC to uh to work a basketball game? Wow. Um 
You know, I've, I've been asked that question a couple of times, and I don't think I've ever given a definitive answer in either one of them. But, you know, they, they all have their own personality. And I guess, you know, the um, the old uh, uh, Reynolds Coliseum in, in Raleigh probably brought the most memories to me because, you know, I was a student there for two years, and uh, I saw a lot of basketball games on that court. I even played a couple of intramural games on that court. But, uh, you know, that uh, that had a it, – it was like Cameron because it was built – I mean, the, the, the plan for, uh, for Reynolds was exactly the same as it was for Cameron. They just turned it sideways and added more to it long ways so they could seat more people. But it, it had the same plan originally as – as Cameron did, um, you know they 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 are all unique in one way or another. Um, I wish that Wake Forest would get rid of that dead gum motorcycle before the games because it stifles us to death because they turn the exhaust right to us and just about stifle us when they're bringing that uh, the, the mascot on the court. But uh, other than that, you know I get along with with people you know pretty well at, at the other venues. It's, it's not a problem. All right, great. Um, that's all the basketball questions. I'm going to turn okay. it over to Jason uh, for some general broadcasting questions. But uh, thank you okay. again for your time and, uh, and, and for all you've done for the program all these years. Not a problem. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, Bob. So we're going to talk broadcasting. Um, and right. let me start with this. Do you think you look at the game differently from fans as a broadcaster? And do you have any advice for fans to maybe – Help them see something they might otherwise miss? Well, I tell people all the time, because sometimes people say, well, why do you get so blooming exciting, uh, excited during a game? I said, well, you know, I'm a fan, number one, and I just happen to have a microphone in front of me. Uh, so that's the only difference I, I can see between me and just, uh, you, you know, your normal fans. I get, uh, I get excited when something good happens. I get down when something bad happens. I try not to, you know, let that show as much on the, on the air as, as I do the good stuff. But, you know, you, you, just, you, you can't help it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that there, there are – Varying degrees of, of fans, and uh, I, I don't know which which degree I fit in with the, the most, but uh, I, I think probably um, those that that enjoy the game, uh, no matter what's going on, and don't get you know too low when things aren't going like they want them to. Uh, I know some people that you know you'd think they were they'd lost their their best friend or their brother or whatever when, when Duke loses. But uh, you can't do that. Uh, you have to remember that it is 18 to 22-year-old boys playing with a round ball on a wood floor, and it's a game. And if you look at it that way, I think you can enjoy the things a whole lot more than if you you pretend that it's, it's life or death. Uh, and, you know, you're – yeah, I know if it's a, a game against State or Carolina, uh, it, the, the stakes are probably a little bit higher for the fans. But still, you know, it all evens out. It'll, it'll, <laughs> it's not going to affect your paycheck at all unless you're betting heavily, which you shouldn't do in the first place. But uh, I, I think that uh, that sometimes fans just really uh, take it too seriously. And I, I do when I'm working, but I try to leave it, uh, leave it in the press box or wherever when I leave the arena. You know, we're, we're talking about being a journalist and being a fan. What, what do you think is the hardest part of your job that fans don't see? What are, what are the things that, that uh, maybe we're not aware of that go into preparation and broadcasting that, that people may not be aware of? Well, I, you know, people don't really realize how much work does go into, like, you know, a football broadcast. okay. Yeah, it's a Saturday afternoon for three hours, uh, but it's more than that for us. Um, like I said earlier, I go to practice uh, Sunday nights and uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and uh, I talk with the assistant coaches to uh, to get uh, you know the, the upcoming game plan or changes in you know what they're doing, personnel, things like that. I talk with the players, I get to know them and how what they're feeling. And, uh, you know, I start my preparation uh, on Monday nights or sometime Monday 
to get ready for because I do, you know, my uh, my spotters chart that I've had for probably a little over 40 years because I did high school ball uh, in Albemarle for eight years before I ever got the uh, the job at Duke. And uh, I haven't really changed a whole lot from those early days. Um, I still like the uh, the score sheet that I'm the uh, score sheet that I'm using in basketball and the uh, the spotters chart that I'm using in football and. Uh, I've had uh, the same spotter for football for 46 years. Uh, our families went to church together when we were in Albemarle. Our, they, we knew each other very well and were good friends. And, you know, uh, when I, I, I asked him when we were working or when we were going to church together if he wanted to help me in spot for me, and he said he'd try. And he stayed with me there. And then when I came to Durham and got the Duke job, I asked him again, and he said, sure. And he only missed one season, and that was when his company transferred him. But uh, we were playing Indiana out there, and he was in Peoria, Illinois. He drove over and spotted for me that uh, that game. So I still count him working that season because he uh, he worked the game for me. But you know, to have loyalty like that, that's that's unbelievable. But um, you you have to have people uh, in your crew that you rely on. And uh, I think that that starts uh, with your analyst because he can he can make you sound a lot better or he can make you sound a lot worse if uh, if it's not the right person. And I've been so blessed to have Wes Chesson for 30. This will be our 36th year together. And uh, there again, it's family. Um, I've known his daughter and son, and now they're both parents of, of multiple children. Wes is a a grandfather five times over and uh so you know things like that you you just you, you can't plan on something like that happening but um you know to have uh have John Roth uh, in with me in, in basketball and and John probably knows more about Duke athletics than anybody on the planet um because he was a student at Duke in the uh, late 70s and then a newspaper writer for a while and then came to Duke as SID or assistant SID but you know, just people like that, and uh, to uh, to have engineers that you really trust. Um, when I the first year I I was the play-by-play announcer, I had to. Uh, of course, we didn't have as involved a setup as we do now, uh, because all I had to do was uh, put the uh, the uh, little uh, broadcast uh, on the. Uh, on the table there and plug in two uh two microphones and uh stick the uh the wire that the telephone company had, had installed stick it in the back of the, the amplifier and then um call the the office uh at, at wdnc and check it out see if they were getting a signal and if they did we went right on with it and that was <laughs> that was the real basics in those days but now it's so i couldn't i couldn't even take the equipment out of the box much less set it up now but thankfully, I've got uh, John <laughs> Rose, and he has just been so good to me and uh, and and for me uh, to handle that. And um, you know, it's just you you, do, you depend on so many people, and uh, and they're just you know, I could spend uh, another twenty minutes talking about the people that have worked with me, but uh, they know who they are. <laughs> I, I I have to tell you, I, I mean, I'm just. I'm reveling in all these stories that you're telling and the reflections that you're giving us. It's really, uh, it, it's been fabulous. Let me conclude with this question because I think all Duke fans <laughs> secretly have the same wish. We all want to be you. <laughs> so what's your advice for the aspiring uh, the aspiring basketball or, or, or football announcer? What, what What's the thing that we should all know how to do how, how can we get your job how can we get your life <laughs> <laughs> well uh as i tell a lot of young guys that i've i've mentored don't try to be me don't copy the things that i do take them and mold them into the way you do things and develop your own style and that's not original that came to me in let's see in 1973 before I got the Duke job I spent about a half hour with Chris Schenkel and he gave me some of the best advice on the way to conduct myself the way to uh, 
handle situations in broadcast, and I will be forever grateful to Chris for doing that for me. And, uh, you know, you, you, I've tried to, Im- to impart that to young people whenever I talk to, uh, to classes, uh, you know, of, of aspiring broadcasters, and I tell them all the time, don't try to copy me. Don't try to be me. I've seen too many people try to be somebody else in this business, and they fall flat on their face because you can't, um, you know, you can't take a, a Chris Schenkel and try to do everything the way he did, or uh, you know anybody else that's been in the business for a long, long time. So you know, just don't try to do it. Be yourself. Take the things that you like from those those particular broadcasters, but make it yourself and. Uh, You'll be a whole lot, a uh, whole lot more successful. Uh, well, I, I love it. All, all your advice has been fabulous. Um, I think all of us are here are going to apply for your job because we have the qualification. <laughs> We're all fans, and we love to talk. <laughs> right. That, <laughs> that, that's going to be two prerequisites, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, you have done a great, great service to the entire Duke community for for forty plus years now. We we feel lucky to have you, and and again, we are we're just lucky and thankful that we had you here on the podcast with us as you embark on your final season. Um, you know, let me let me just ask this as a last thing. Um, as you reflect back, can can you believe that that it's almost all done? What 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 are the feelings that went into the decision? to say, I'm, I'm finished? Well, I had always said that, uh, well, not always, but when I, after I'd had the job for a while, I said, you know, one day it's going to end. And I want to know when it's time to step, out, step away. Uh, I've seen too many guys who did not do that, and I think it sullied their, uh, their image. Um, I just... I think you have to know when it's time for you to, to, to step aside and let somebody else uh, sit in the, in the big chair. And uh, to, uh, whoever uh, succeeds me, I want to wish them the best and to, to tell them to do the best they can and, uh, and be the best broadcaster they can be. And it'll work out for them. Uh, that, that works. That works. Bob Harris. <laughs> 40-year voice of the Blue Devils, thank you again for joining us on the DBR podcast. Um, We are big fans. We are eternally, all Duke fans are eternally in your debt, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. I I appreciate it. I wanted to add one more thing. Um, Bob, um, feel free to not share your thoughts about how great retirement is with Mike Krzyzewski. (laughs) (laughs) I'll try not to. (laughs) Thank you. I hear you. All right. Thanks, guys. So guys, God, that was just, oh, it was so amazing. Bob, Bob had so much insight. Um, uh, by the way, props to Donald. We didn't get to say it during the interview, but Donald was the one who arranged this whole thing. He's the one who reached out to Bob and, and convinced Bob to come talk to us. So Donald, um, uh, way to go. Uh, you are the man. Thank you for doing that. Um, I, I thought, really quick reaction to it. Um, I, I'll start because the story that Bob told um, about talking to Coach K early in his tenure and Coach K like almost being on the verge of tears and, and Coach K saying, if they only give me time, I can really do it here. They just have to give me time. And then Bob saying that a decade or so, almost a decade later, um, they were sitting together after Duke won their national title and Bob said to him, hey, Coach, they gave you time. That was, to me, as revealing a story about Coach K as I've ever heard. It was just, ah, oh, it was incredibly... Uh, and there was so much that Bob told us, I felt like, that that gave us a glimpse inside the program that we don't usually get. Um, Duke basketball and, to a lesser extent, Duke football are very closed, and, and they, they have to be. Um, and I feel like Bob pulled back the curtain and, and got, Bob, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Donald, you brought him on the show. What, what was your favorite part of the interview? So I, it, it was similar to that. And, you know, he that part was great because, you know, we've talked about our crazy – um, stories with Coach K, you know, Nolan Smith talked about the samurai sword and, and uh, you know, um, uh, Shane Battier talked about um, the I'm just a poor Polish boy from Chicago type of story. But that was the most revealing about, like you said, about the program and, and what the motivation is that Coach K has every day. The fact that, you know, this young coach 
back then was saying, if they just give me time, I'm going to, I'm going to get this thing done. And 10 years later, they rehash that moment from a decade prior where, you know, and they're saying, Hey, the time we gave you the time and, and look what you did with it. You took it and ran with it. Um, I, I like the similar story that, he, that uh, Bob Harris talked about with, um, uh, with coach Cutcliffe, where he, uh, where Coach Cutcliffe was talking about him building a program, how he wanted to, you know, bring kids in, he wanted to do it this, you know, the right way and and get the program uh, to a state, you know, where that it is today. And Bob Harris saying, "It's really funny you mentioned that, Coach, because I had that exact same, you know, st- I had the exact same conversation with a coach, and it turned out okay." And, and Coach Cutcliffe goes, "Who's who was that?" And it was Coach Tashevsky. Uh and, and I think that that is, uh, it's almost like incredible like it's, it's almost like unfathomable that bob harris could live through this twice like go through this in the same career go through similar struggles with a program and similar you know resurgences of a program with two different coaches and two different sports that doesn't happen in in college often and i think uh it's incredible that he was a part of both and that he's been around through all the good times. And I mean, he's been around through some very dark times, both for football and for basketball. And, and I think that story was very revealing in the fact that, you know, sometimes these, you know, the circle that, you know, this, the, we circle around the sun a couple of times and, and the same story can apply to two different situations and they both have turned out great. Um, you know, and, and I think that, uh, and I'm glad to see that on the last, you know, last season um, that he has with us, um, uh, as the voice of the Blue Devils, he is going to take hold and, and basically narrate the story of a resurgent football program and a basketball team that is favored to be very, 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 very good. Um, and I think that's very fitting. Yeah, and uh, you, you guys covered, I think, the, the most revealing and, and most important part of the interview. And just to add on to what Donald said about football, I kind of watched that transformation for Duke football up close because that was really like when I was in school and then right after it. And I can't tell you how often Coach Cutcliffe talks about, you know, and and he says this to the the media and to the fans, but within the program, he talks so much about the importance of building a program more than building a team. And and as I pointed out to Bob during the interview, um, the way that he was saying that Coach K would describe that, it was like, it was like the same speech. It, it, it's amazing how similar the, the language is and that Coach Cutcliffe, you know, when he was hired, he said all the right things about he's now at a, at a school that, that really values academics. He has an opportunity to build something special that, you know, he can't really do at an SEC school because the, the standards are different. And a, a lot of times you might say, that, oh, well, a coach is going to say that stuff. It's all bluster because he got hired by a good school. And, and that's what he's supposed to say. And and I think the two fans were right if they felt that way to be skeptical of those words when Coach Cutcliffe was hired. But I mean, look at the results and, and and look at how well he's done. And and you know maybe the maybe the standards are different than what they were ten or fifteen years ago. But you you'd like to think that given that guys are still graduating and going on to to have you know real productive lives, that that Coach Cutcliffe didn't really sacrifice the standards of Duke University to make the program that he's made today. And, and it looks a lot like Coach K's. And let's be honest, Duke football, a school, you know, that has a stadium that only holds 30,000 seats and that has a much smaller donor base than schools like Alabama and Texas and USC and all those kinds of places. Duke football may not be able to do much better than winning an ACC Coastal Championship or, or winning an ACC Championship, maybe. Um, Coach Cutcliffe has, has gotten has – That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so so the program is about as far along as as anyone could have reasonably, or even maybe slightly unreasonably, expected. And and Bob Harris was able to kind of lift the curtain on that and show how how the the basketball program and the football program are both operating kind of in the same sphere. And at this point, they're operating at more or less the same standards of excellence. And and that was really cool to hear. And and also, you know, at the beginning of the interview, he talked about how. Um, He's very proud to be associated with a program where when he wakes up in the morning, he doesn't have to check the, you know, the, the police blotter to see which of, which of the players got arrested recently. And, and that has to feel good, too, because as he points out, he, he's very close to all the guys on the team and the, and the coaches and everybody involved in the program. And he doesn't want those guys to, to be, you know, out getting DUIs or, or, or what have you. Um, so, so to him, it's got to feel really good because in some way he's got sort of a parental 
um, relationship with with many of the kids in the program. So the whole thing was just was really great, and it's it's amazing that we've had you know we're we're a small school, uh, obviously in a big conference and a big name, but that we've had the same outstanding guy who's been commentating our games since my dad was a student at Duke. Uh, it, it's it's impressive, Sam. One thing I will add. Um, you talk about, uh, you know, oh, maybe this is as much as Duke can do in football. Uh, my response to that, two words, Coastal Carolina. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's right? a good point. I mean, and, and maybe I'm, Coastal, maybe, maybe Coastal, Carolina, <laughs> Coastal Carolina just won the College World Series. Uh, you know, so Their anything. Their first ever happen. championship in anything. Yeah, anything can happen. Uh, and, and again, I want to thank, thank, thank. Bob Harris, the, the voice of the Blue Devils, um, uh, Duke basketball, Duke football are not the same without you. Have a great, great, great final season. I hope that you add to your championship and bowl totals this year <laughs> as a way, as a send off for, uh, for a fine, fine gentleman who, um, who has been so, meant so much to the university and, and to all of our enjoyment. Um, Bob, I'm tipping my cap to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so guys, uh, topic number three, we were talking about how Bob Harris uh, was really revealing about Coach K. You want to talk really revealing about Coach K? How about Coach K himself? For the first time ever, Coach K has sat down and done a podcast interview. No, he did not do it with us. And, and I, I will freely admit that I am mad at the Duke Sports Information Department, who I've been begging for over a year now. Please let me do an interview with Coach K. They gave Coach K's first podcast interview to J.J. Redick. And I think all three of us have listened to it. Um, there was just uh, – it, it was an hour of incredible insight into Coach K, how he thinks, uh, how he runs the Duke program, his relationship with his players. It was absolutely fabulous. Sam, I'll start with you. Give me just a couple of the takeaways that you got from this remarkable, wonderful interview that J.J. Redick uh, did with Coach K. Well, my first impression is that it's very cool listening to J.J. Redick talk about I, – I enjoy his podcast, and we've talked about it here before. Um, the way that J.J. talks about the Duke program is really cool because he grew up as a Duke fan – turned into an excellent basketball player, got to go to Duke and got to become, you know, one of, or by his own, by his own hard work, became one of the greatest players in Duke history. You know, he, he's one of the five or 10 best players we've ever had. Uh, he scored, he scored a lot of points. He was, he was really effective. And from what he has said on the podcast, his time at Duke was kind of a struggle, especially his first couple of years. He, he had struggled stay. He had, he had a hard time staying in shape, um, you know, following instructions and, and, and really focusing and, and being as good as he could be. And alcohol, from, alcohol. Yeah. All, all that, all the, all the standard things that plague college students, but not necessarily things you think about for college students who have to be on ESPN 30 nights a year. Right. So, I mean, listening to him talk about his college experiences is, is, is weirdly similar to what my college experience sounded like and what, what yours may, I, I didn't know you guys in college, but what yours may have sounded like too. And, so there's a, uh, there's a certain reverence that he has for the program and for the coaches, and it really came out in that interview and how much he respects Coach K. And then conversely, how much Coach K appreciates how J.J. has grown through the years from being, you know, kind of a, a, kind of a bratty teenager to being this very, like, upstanding guy as, like a, as an NBA veteran who's bringing along other players and raising a family and all the things that he's doing. So – Hearing that relationship and, and you know, weird, I, I'm probably never going to be particularly close with either of those guys um, to hear the way that they talk about each other was really neat and, and made me feel really good again about um, about how much I, I like watching this program play basketball. Uh, it, it, it makes you feel like it's a it's a good thing overall. And then specifically, um, Coach K had some revealing things to say about the one and done era and how Duke has treated it. And I, I and the three of us kind of went back and forth before this podcast, but, um, but I, I thought, I thought there was something interesting about the way coach K noted that um, maybe 10 years ago or so went before one and done um, was implemented when kids could still jump from high school, that there were fewer like Duke type kids who could, who could really cut it at uh who could cut it at Duke 
for the time, for whatever time they're going to be there. And I don't know if that's true as much as the the kids were sort of forced to get better because they all knew they were going to have to go to college, um, right? Like like Jaleel Okafor and Jabari Parker and Brandon Ingram, these guys in high school, when they were sophomores in high school, they knew they were going to be NBA lottery picks. And they knew that if they came out after their senior years of high school, they would be they would be lottery picks. They didn't really have to think about going to college, right? Like LeBron James didn't really think about going to college um, after a certain point pretty early in his high school career. Fast forward to, to the to the one and done era, and all these guys acknowledge they're like, I have two choices. I can go to the NBA or I can go to the sorry, I can go to college after high school, or I can go do anything else. And anything else isn't as cool as college because you don't get to live on a college campus. You don't get to be on a team that, that people are watching on TV. You don't get, you know, sort of all the, all the perks of being on campus. You might make a, a couple bucks like playing in the D league or playing overseas, uh, but it's not going to well, be. They can't, they're not, they're not allowed to play in the D league, but they can play overseas. They're not allowed Sorry, to play. They, in the they, D can league. Play, they can play. They can play overseas. Um, they can play. No, they can play in the D league. They can play in the D league yeah. one year and then go from there. Um, Regardless, they can be yeah. they can be non NBA professionals, or they can go to college. Correct. And 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 frankly, none of those options, even if they'll make you more money, are are as attractive at this point as going to college. And so I think that kids like Billy Okafor probably say sophomore year, well, I'm going to have to go to college, so I might as well be eligible and work hard and and be able to get into the best school I can get into, or at least have those options open to me. Because let's face it, one of the best programs in the country is Duke. And and Duke has some kind of academic standards that are that I, I assume are higher than whatever the NCAA minimum is. So I thought that those comments were a little weird, uh, and maybe Coach K is being disingenuous. But at the same time, um, you know he has, to his credit, adapted to the rules. And there was a there was a few years there, kind of like right around when JJ was graduating, and then until um, Kyrie Irving committed, uh, which is right around when I was in school when people were kind of dumping on the Duke recruiting and the Duke program, they hadn't made it far in the tournament in a few years. They hadn't been to the final four. Um, the kids that were coming out were still going to the NBA, but they weren't, they weren't the stars that they had maybe been in, you know, the years prior to that, there weren't Lou Dangs and Jason Williams and Shane Battier's guys like that weren't coming out. Um, but to his credit, coach K adapted. And, and as we've seen the last few years, there's been a real resurgence as he has embraced what the system is now he's he's taking as much advantage of it as he can and and still as far as we know hasn't really compromised the standards of the program because the kids who were on campus are still going to class and doing what they have to do to remain eligible you know in, in case things don't work out for them in the nba so overall i was still pretty impressed with the interview and and uh, while i'm jealous that jj got him first uh i, I thought it was re a really interesting listen so, Donald, your turn to give us your um, impressions from the interview. So I thought the interview was great, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about something similar to what Sam talked about, but focus on uh, there was a point where uh, Coach K was talking about, um, you know, how J.J. had progressed and how he had grown a lot since his freshman year um, and how he thought before, um, you know, even in high school, that he was going to be one of the great Duke players um, to ever come through the program. Um, and JJ basically said, yeah, I would have probably acted a lot more mature back then if social media was the way it is today. And I think that was a very big point. And I think that's also a lot of the reason why uh, this one and done era has kind of gained more steam um, and why maybe some of these Duke players have fit into fit more into the mold in Coach K's eyes um, than the. Uh, ones beforehand, and, and here's what here's what I mean by that. I think that back, you know, up until about 2010, 2011, social media wasn't really a big deal. Um, I mean, we had Facebook. I mean, when I was in school, Facebook came two weeks before I graduated college. So from 2004 to by maybe 2009, 2010, Facebook was really it was still very restrictive. You couldn't just like join groups and stuff like that. It was mainly just your college and you could see friends from other colleges, but you couldn't really join in a lot of their networks. It was very restrictive in, the, in how you interacted with other people outside of your college network or outside of your high school network. 2010 is when it kind of opened up to everybody. And if you recall when Harrison Barnes committed to UNC, when he had his press conference to declare where he was going, it was down to UNC, us, and I forgot who the other school was, maybe Kentucky. And he said, I'm going to the school of the coach. I'm going to Skype. 
And it was at that point that most Duke fans knew that he wasn't going to Duke because, yo, we don't Skype. Like, that's not our deal. And, and I feel like now with social media the, more the, in alignment. By the way, Donald, Donald yes. really quick, the other school was Iowa State. Iowa State, yes, because he was from, from Ames, correct. He was from Ames, yep. Yes. Yep. So the, the social media aspect of that has enhanced – how recruiting is done, how recruiting is not done. You know, we have, you know, as, as alums, we are quote unquote boosters and we have to limit what we do on social media uh, with these recruits. But also it gives more of an insight in, in, in coaches, not just with Duke, but at other schools and in other sports, they're able to follow these kids at an earlier age and follow what their tendencies are, follow how they grow and see how they mature and see if they are willing or able to adapt to the rigors of college life uh, in Durham. And so I think that might play a lot into how we have altered, uh, how Coach K and the staff has altered their, uh, their, their recruiting stance on some of these players. And I, I think that may, it may be a small issue or maybe a small uh, element to it, but I think it's one that uh, when they mentioned it and they talked about it at great length, about how social media, if it were around when JJ was in school, he probably wouldn't have acted the way he acted his first couple of years. Um, I think that was very poignant, and I think that is probably what has helped shape uh, the landscape of recruiting in college basketball and in college football especially um, you know, since then. And I think that is probably uh, the one thing that I took away from the most. Well, you know what's interesting about that? is at the very beginning of the interview, I took copious notes as I was listening to it because I just thought it was so fascinating. At the very beginning of the interview, Coach K admits that he has a secret Instagram and a secret Twitter account. Yep. Even his players, even his players who he considers family, do not know what his, what his logins are, uh, you know, what his usernames are on Instagram and Twitter. And he has those because he wants to be able to keep up with and pay attention to what's going on in his players' Again, his family, he considers them his family, his players' lives, and, and, and it, he uses it for tracking recruits as well. So you are dead on target about that. I thought it was really interesting that Coach K said the reason no one knows about those accounts is that if he wants to talk to someone, he doesn't want to talk to them on Instagram. He doesn't want to talk to them on Twitter. He wants to pick up the phone and make a phone call and talk to them. And I thought that was, that was pretty telling to me about what kind of a person he is. A few of the other things I took away, um, I thought it was fascinating when Coach K talked about branding. And he said that one of the things that, and, and this again speaks to the social media aspect. And he said one of the things that they tell kids when they arrive on Duke's campus for the first time is that these kids' brand has now been merged with three other brands. Brand number one is Duke University, a world class school, you know, internationally known. Brand number two is Duke basketball, per, you know, perhaps the finest basketball program, probably the finest basketball program in the country. Uh, in the world in terms of university basketball. And brand number three is Coach K himself, his brand. And he said that they, they really talk to these kids about how everything they do will represent all three of those brands. And I can imagine, can you imagine being a Duke freshman arriving on campus and Coach K sits down and explains to you the responsibility that you are taking by becoming a Duke player and being a representative of those three very important, very sacred brands that have untarnished reputations. Another thing I thought that was absolutely amazing, to me this was the most remarkable part of the interview. When Coach Gay started talking about JJ's time at Duke, he said, yeah, we taught you some things, but most of it you did on your own. And then they started talking about systems. And Coach K said, when he has a special player, a player like J.J. Redick, a player like Jason Williams, a player like Kyrie Irving, you know, on and on and on. Um, he said when he has a special player, his system becomes that special player. Coach K said you have to let them go. And he said it all started with Johnny Dawkins. He saw Johnny Dawkins and he went, I can't make Johnny Dawkins fit into what I want to do. What I want to do has to fit into what Johnny Dawkins succeeds at and what Johnny Dawkins is so great at. And it then that conversation then merged into Coach K talking about USA basketball, the Olympic team, and how when he, gets, when he got together the first time with Jason Kidd, and Jason Kidd said, what do you want me to do? Coach K said, I want you to do whatever you're great at, and I'll make it work with what you're great at. And that's, to me, that's, Scott, so insightful, so interesting to hear. That we're talking about the, the greatest coach in college basketball history, the most winningest coach in college basketball history. And he says... What I think doesn't matter. 
What I need to do is make my thinking, make my system, make my team fit around these truly special players that come along every so often. I think that's, that, to me, that was just incredible insight. And, and that, the makes, last that, makes players, that makes players want to play for them because, oh, you know, you yeah. think about it, there's a lot of players that are like, hey, I, you know, I, this is my style. And coach is like, well, that's not my style. You're going to play my way or the highway. And he's like, oh, that's how you play? Cool. We'll make it so that that's your strength. We're going to exploit that strength and make it so that everybody, you know, this system highlights everybody's strengths and where nobody has to kind of fit in. The coach fits into the fits the system in to how his players played. I think that's brilliant. And Duke oh, yeah. has and enough. Duke has enough experience with with a lot of different types of guys. I mean, look in the rafters at all the different stars throughout Coach K's time. None of them are really that similar, right? Like Johnny yep. Dawkins had a totally different style from Bobby Hurley, and Christian Leitner was different than Danny Ferry, who was different than Shane Battier and Luol Deng. Like all these guys have all their unique qualities. And at this point, I mean, Coach K has the whole Olympic thing, so he has every star on the planet who can say, oh yeah, well, my, my star game was, you know, we, we adapted the Olympic team to my, my skills by doing X, Y, Z. So at this point, it's like a, it's like a train that can't stop itself. Uh, it, it was, it was fabulous. And folks, ordinarily, I wouldn't tell you to go out there and listen to a rival podcast. Listen to the JJ Reddick podcast, the vertical podcast with coach K. There'll be a lot of commercials. JJ pauses for commercial breaks. A lot of the time, Apparently, he doesn't have enough money from his NBA contract, needs to earn money off his podcast. You'll notice we have no commercials, but JJ at least gets the big names. He got Coach K. Folks, go out and listen to it. It's really special. Okay, guys, time for us to do parting shots. Uh, Donald, what you got for me? So I'm going to list a few names, and I apologize because I probably don't have a complete list, but this is the list that I have, and I will tell you what this list is as soon as I'm done. Shannon Roberry, Lindsey Harding, Kyrie Irving, Mike Krzyzewski, Abby Johnston, Letitia Beck, Leona McGuire, and Ibshihad Muhammad. Those are the Duke uh, athletes uh, or former Duke athletes who will be competing in the Olympics in Rio next month. Um, we have track represented, we have basketball represented, men and women, diving, golf, and fencing. Uh, and once again, you know, of many schools, there are a lot of schools that like to pride themselves on sending uh, one or two athletes to the Olympics. Duke is sending a whole heap of athletes and one, and one legendary coach. Um, it's going to be a great uh, time, and there's, and there's something for everybody. Um, if you're an Olympic fan like I am, I, I love the Olympics. It's one of my favorite events to watch, period. Um, it's going to be great to be able to see so many people representing uh, not just the United States or, or their, or their uh, fellow nations, but also our university, um, and they're doing it at, at the highest level. So congrats to all of them. Um, best of luck to every single one of them in the Olympics. Um, I know they're all going to do well. Hopefully they all uh, come back with some hardware um, uh, to uh, pr proudly show off uh, around their necks. Um, but I, I think those are the, the list of people. Um, hopefully I'm not missing anybody. If not, I apologize. Um, but those Duke Olympians deserve our support, um, no matter who they're, uh, who, which country they're representing. Um, and I think they're going to do well. So, uh, best of luck to those guys. And your turn parting shot time. Donald, that was a really cool one. Thank you for, uh, for doing that. Cause I hadn't been thinking about that. And I also love the Olympics. So I will be, uh, I will be watching and rooting for the Duke guys, even if they're not Americans. Um, my quick parting shot, I found out recently that I am going to be uh, back in Durham for homecoming this year. It's the first weekend in October. Um, and uh, it coincides with a, with a special event um, that I would otherwise probably not be able to go to, which is International Bluegrass Music Association weekend in Raleigh. Uh, so if you are a bluegrass music fan and a Duke football fan, uh, get at me on the forum because uh, we have some planning to do because uh, there's, there's a lot of overlapping events that I would like to be able to attend and I won't have a car. Uh, so I look forward to that, and that is my parting shot. Uh, my parting shot um, is uh, farewell to someone that I, I, I do remember, uh, DeMontez Stitt of Clemson University. I was, uh, I was looking around Twitter the other day, and uh, Nolan Smith tweeted that he was shocked to learn that DeMontez Stitt, who played at Clemson from 2007 to 2011, guys, that's not long ago, DeMontez Stitt died of, apparently of a heart attack at his home in Charlotte. Um, I remember him from Clemson. He was a very good player for the Clemson Tigers. Uh, he'd been playing overseas. Uh, last year, he was in Turkey. 
Um, and, uh, you know, they're still investigating. No one knows exactly what happened. Again, they think it was a heart attack. But, man, this guy was in the ACC just a few years ago. Uh, it, it's just it's just shocking and so sad. My Sorry? class at Clemson. He was my class at Clemson. So yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. Old. Very good player, too. I do. I definitely yeah. remember him from his college days. He was a very yeah. good player. You yeah. want to know a really, great really killed us a lot of times in, uh, uh, when we played against him. Yes, yes. Uh, a great fact about the Montez Stitt that I found. He is the only player in Clemson University history to start on four NCAA tournament teams. Now, I would be willing to bet you Clemson's been up and down over the years. They've usually sort of been in the lower half of the ACC. There are probably very, very few players at Clemson to even play on four NCAA tournament teams because Clemson doesn't usually make the NCAAs four years in a row. But DeMontez Stitt is the only player in Clemson basketball history to start on four NCAA tournament teams. Um, so a, 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 a sad loss and, and a player that you know we still have memories of um, really succeeding just down the road at Clemson. Um, sorry to see you gone, DeMontez. So that's going to wrap it up for us here in the Duke Basketball Report podcast, episode number 54. Donald, thanks for joining me tonight. Hey, good to see you. Good to hear from you guys, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Yep. And Sam, out there in Denver, I appreciate you joining us as well. Absolutely. Thank you for uh, hosting this week, and uh, thank you again to Donald for uh, getting the Bob Harris interview uh, lined up. That was really cool. That was fabulous. And by the way, folks, um, if you if you're someone who's just joining the podcast fairly new, or if you've you know, if you picked up on us in the past six months or so, uh, just so you know, if you look through our archive, in the off season especially, we do a lot of these interviews. We've mentioned, we spoke to Nolan Smith. We spoke to Shane Battier. Uh, we spoke to Chris Collins, um, former Duke basketball player and head coach at Northwestern, Chris Collins. So every so often we get these really cool interviews and um, uh, they're always a lot of fun. Uh, uh, Bob Harris was fabulous and wonderful. But go back to the archives. Check those old ones out. I'm sure you'll, you'll hear something interesting on them. Um, even if the st other stuff we talk about is a little bit dated, the interviews themselves, those are timeless, no question about it. Um, for Donald and Sam, I'm Jason Evans. Thanks again, folks, for joining us on the DVR podcast. And Duke Band, it's your turn. Take us home.